rated to my specifications, Bill Gates's billions, and I still wouldn't be able to believe that. Um, and one of the reasons I can't believe that is exactly what you suggested. If God sometimes intervenes, then how do we account for the non-interventions? Whether it's huge, uh, massive, barbarisms and atrocities like the Holocaust. I mean, think of the millions of prayers that went up from the victims of the Holocaust. From Jews, but also from the roughly one million Christians killed in the Holocaust. If God could have intervened to stop that, but chose not to, what kind of sense does that make? Or on the private level, you know, the tragedies that never make the newspapers. A uh, young parent getting terminal cancer. Uh, you know the list of things that happened. I don't have to go through them with you. So I don't believe in an interventionist God, and therefore I don't believe that God did all kinds of spectacular things back then that no longer happen. To relate this more specifically to Jesus, I don't see Jesus as a divine intervention. Rather, I see Jesus as somebody who was so radically open to the Spirit of God that he could be filled with God's Spirit to a remarkable degree and to um, maybe make that more understandable. I see Jesus as St. Francis with an exclamation point. And I suggest St. Francis because he's commonly seen as the most Christ-like of the post-biblical saints and so forth. Um, is Francis a human possibility? Oh, yeah. Did God intervene in the life of Francis? I don't think so. I think Francis had visions, but I don't think God singled out Francis to be remarkable. I think, again, for whatever set of reasons, Francis became so open to the reality of God that he could be St. Francis. And the same way with Jesus. So I see Jesus as, once again, so radically open to the Spirit of God uh, that he could be filled with the Spirit of God, which in his case obviously involved a kind of charisma and wisdom and passion and so forth. So one, of, one of the little Christian phrases that gives me trouble has to do with the afterlife in heaven or hell. Okay, good. Just little questions here. <laughs> yeah. Jesus, God, intervention, afterlife. Okay, okay. <laughs> Let me begin with a negative comment. I reject the modern, secular, dogmatic conviction that death is simply annihilation. I think that claims to know too much. You know, that we're just, let's say that um, that dogmatic conviction that consciousness is a product of the brain and therefore, when the brain ceases to work, that's it. I think that claims to know too much. Uh, there are tantalizing hints that consciousness is at least momentarily able to separate from the brain. That's really mind-blowing. But I'm thinking of out-of-body experiences, which are well enough documented and even verified so that all but a dogmatic secularist would have to say, I guess they happen. Out-of-body experiences in which there's a sense of seeing one's own body from a vantage point outside of oneself. They're fairly common in near-death experiences. They also happen sometimes apart from near-death experiences, where you actually are seeing things from a vantage point outside of your head. Now, if consciousness can even momentarily separate from the body, then in an important sense, we don't know what the hell is going on here. Okay. Second claim. 
I think whenever the afterlife is made central to religion, it creates a distortion. Suddenly it's about going to heaven. Suddenly it's about, as I mentioned last night, uh, hope for reward, fear of punishment, and it focuses attention on the self. I once said that if I had to make a list of Christianity's ten worst contributions to the religions of the world, on that list would be the emphasis of popular Christianity over the centuries on an afterlife. Third comment. I'm convinced that when we die, we do not die into nothingness, but we die into God. You know, in words from Paul, we live unto the Lord and we die unto the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Next comment. I have that confidence, but I have no idea what it means specifically. Does it mean that personal consciousness survives death? And by personal consciousness, I mean consciousness that I am Marcus. And if there is an afterlife I'm, and I'm there, will I remember that, yeah, I used to live in Oregon and have a dog named Henry and a wife named Marianne. Uh, and when I say I have no idea if personal consciousness survives, some people are puzzled. If personal consciousness doesn't survive, what the hell is an afterlife for, you know? But think about it. And I'm not denying anything here. I'm simply puzzling this through with you. And I think there are some, there are some definite not knowings here. Um, does an afterlife involve reunion with loved ones? With family, for example. A lot of funeral sermons sometimes suggest so. But is that good news or bad news? <laughs> And, and I'm, not, I, I'm not just making a joke out of that, though the fact that you all laughed means you kind of got the point. Uh, for some people, family has been the primary source of love and joy in their lives. For other people, it's been the primary source of suffering. I'm going to be with those people forever? And if somebody says, well, they'll all be changed. Well, will they be the same people then? My point being that to imagine that the afterlife is a continuation in some form of our self-consciousness here and of our relationships here um, goes beyond what I can affirm. And yet, the older I get, um, the less anxiety I have about death. Uh, I love it here, and I'll miss it. And if I have the kind of death that involves knowing six months or a year or two years that I have a terminal illness, I suspect that will be a rocky time for a while. But the bottom line is, I don't have any anxiety about dying. And... Uh, and to some extent, that is because of a confidence that when I die, I die into God. And I have no idea what that means. But it's like, what more do I need to know? When you move from conventional religion to the more intentional religion, it changes everything. And when you remove a fear of hell and a checklist of how to get into heaven, um, numbers tend to decrease. <laughs> um, how do you see this change to more intentional Christianity for mainline churches in the coming decade? Okay, and I missed one phrase. Numbers decrease, did you say? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> It could be that, percentage-wise, that more people respond to fear than to more positive motivations. And therefore, 
perhaps it is the case that numerically more Christians or more people will respond to a Christian message centered on the promise of heaven and the fear of hell. Uh, perhaps especially in a country like the United States, where so much of our religion and our politics is based on fear. I mean, think of the fear-mongering in the political world over the last seven years, basically since 9-11. We have a fear-based politics and, to a large extent, a fear-based religion in this country. I'm thinking of much of conservative and fundamentalist Christianity when I say a fear-based religion. And fear-based politics and fear-based religion oftentimes go hand in hand. Uh, and in this context, I want to say it's amazing how often the phrase do not be afraid, fear not, comes up in the Bible. I've been told that it appears 365 times, one for every day of the year. I've never checked. If that's true, I'm going to have to rethink my understanding of biblical inspiration. Okay. But, but the point is, almost the central message of the Bible is, don't be afraid. Fear not. Okay. And yet, fear-based religion sells in some quarter, quarters. Okay. So having granted that, um, I want to, well, I want to suggest that, that it's not a good motive for wanting to be Christian. I think the motive we can appeal to is what I spoke about last night, those deep yearnings that I think most people share for a fuller connection to what is and that the world be a better place. Or we yearn for transformation, to put it even more simply. I think this is the way, this is the reason that some people who have dropped out of the church are attracted to what we think of as Eastern forms of religion because they're religions of practice and transformation. And it's why some people who remain within the church have adopted a Buddhist practice for their daily life because they yearn for that path of transformation. They yearn for that fuller connection to what is. So, uh, I think the best motive for taking Christianity, or for that matter, any of the enduring religions seriously, is the one that Augustine named around 400, when he said, our hearts are restless until they find their home in you. Okay? Our hearts are restless until we find our home in God, not meaning after death, but that connectedness to God in the present. Now, what does this mean for mainline churches over the next 10 years? Um, I see a direction in mainline congregations that are thriving. A lot of mainline congregations will simply die, not necessarily in the next 10 years, but in the not too distant future. Some of them for demographic reasons, they're just in the wrong place. <laughs> Once upon a time, they might have been in a good place. Um, some of them because there's not enough of a critical mass to sustain the future. You know, if you're in a congregation of 40 or 50 people and all of them are over 60, how are you going to attract the next generation? Basically, you're not for the most part. So there will be... Um, a fair number of mainline congregations that will die. But the ones that are thriving, and the ones I think that will thrive, are those that either already have moved to a more intentional kind of Christianity or are in the process of moving there. The best empirical evidence for this has been assembled by Diana Butler Bass, who's, how many of you recognize her name? Okay, maybe not quite 10% of you. You should know about her. She's important for the future of the church. She's also a very fine writer. She's only in her 40s. 
Um, two of her books I would commend to you in particular. A shorter one called The Practicing Congregation. It's only 120 pages long or so. And it's the result of a three-year, million-dollar research project funded by the Lilly Foundation that she was the head of. And the task of the research project was to identify mainline congregations that are thriving. And these don't necess this doesn't necessarily mean big congregations. The smallest congregation they studied was 35 people. The largest was 3,500. And they identified over 500 congregations that fall into this category of thriving. There are more than that in the country. They simply, when they got to 500, they thought, we got enough. They reduced that to 50 for detailed study, and then reduced that 50 to 10 for on-site visits that I think were three visits of two weeks each in each of these congregations, going to committee meetings, adult education classes, and so forth, all for the sake of trying to discern what makes these congregations tick, the ones that are thriving? And they found four things that they had in common. These are intentional communities, what I was just talking about. They are communities of practice, okay? Actually, that goes with they are intentional communities, so that's still the first one. They are intentional communities and communities of practice. They are progressive theologically. In other words, they deal with the intellectual obstacles that many people have found with an earlier form of Christianity. And their um, theological progressiveness includes uh, openness to gay and lesbian people. Okay. Third characteristic, they are communities of re-traditionalizing, meaning recovering the richness of the Christian tradition the biblical tradition, but also the richness of their own denominational tradition. And fourthly, they are progressive communities politically. Not that everybody in them is progressive politically, but the teaching and preaching encourages um, uh, taking seriously God's passion for justice and God's passion for peace and so forth. Now, this is what mainline congregations that are thriving have in common. That's very exciting. And I suspect there will be more congregations like that 10 years from now than there are now, more 20 years from now than there are 10 years from now, and so forth. I think this is the vocational niche for mainline Christianity. You know, some mainline Christians will sometimes say, well, you know, the conservative churches are growing, so maybe we should become more conservative. If we moved in that direction, we would lose our reason for being. It would be in an abandonment to the vocation that we've been given. So, that answer got a little bit longer than I imagined it might, but I'll...